Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, we have uh, two uh, outstanding speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, each one will speak for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and will uh, leave about five minutes or so for questions. Um, we have a hard stop at, at 1 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. So I'd like to uh, start the program with Dr. Jeannie Hendrickson, who is the Associate Professor of Laboratory Medicine, who will give us an update on transfusion medicine. Thank you. All right, well, thank you guys for inviting me to talk today. In 25 minutes or less, we'll go through all of transfusion medicine. <laughs> All right, so our objectives, which I thought we had 30 minutes, but in 25 minutes, these are our three objecti objectives, which we will work through one at a time. So our first objective is to briefly um, go through the risk-benefit ratio of transfused blood products and then one coagulation factor. So as we're aware with everything in medicine, we need to carefully weigh the pros and cons, and transfusion is no exception. So we need to improve oxygen carrying capacity, we need to improve coagulation status while minimizing the serious hazards of transfusion. So although infectious complications of transfusion are what most of us have been trained to worry about, practically this is only a very small percentage of transfusion-associated complications. So over the course of many of our careers, the risk of contracting HIV and hepatitis from transfused blood products has significantly declined. However, there's been very little change in the risk of non-infectious serious hazards of transfusions, which are also known as knee shots in the world of transfusion. This is a slide I like from the United Kingdom Serious Hazards of Transfusion um, website. And on this slide, you can see that only about 2% of transfusion complications are associated with infectious disease transmission from blood products, and more than 98% of complications are due to other problems associated with transfusion. So we're just briefly in two slides going to talk about what do we test blood for in Connecticut. So blood collection sites in Connecticut test blood by NAT as well as antibody testing for hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus. HIV 1 and 2, HTLV 1 and 2, syphilis, Chagas disease, and West Nile virus. In addition to this infectious disease testing, screening questions eliminate a number of pot potentially infectious blood donors, with one particular question simply asking donors whether they feel well today. If they say no, their blood is not used for transfusion. These are the risks of HIV and Hep B and Hep C that I generally quote to my patients. So for hepatitis B, the risk of transfusion transmission is approximately 1 in 300,000. Now many of our patients are immunized and thus this risk is practically lower. For HIV and Hep C, the risk is between 1 in 1 to 2 million. And to put this into perspective, in the US we transfuse approximately 15 million red cell units each year. So approximately seven patients in the US every year are exposed to HIV through blood transfusion. And of these, most will become infected. So although this number is not zero, this is quite a low number. So today we don't have time to go through um, all of the other serious hazards of transfusion, and I'm going to go mostly through transfusion reactions today. Um, but we need to take into consideration liberal versus restrictive transfusion thresholds. And over the course of the past decade, there have been a number of randomized and non-randomized studies done to see whether patients can be transfused at a hemoglobin of 7 and do just as well as if they're transfused at a hemoglobin of 9 and 10. And most of those trials have not been done in oncology patients at all, but have been done in ICU and MICU and pediatric ICU patients. And most of those trials have suggested that a restrictive transfusion threshold is associated with at least as good, and in some cases, better outcome in terms of morbidity and mortality than liberal transfusion thresholds. So taking that into consideration, Yale has recently undertaken a Why Choose Two When One Will Do campaign, which you've probably seen on the LCD monitors over the past month or two. As part of this campaign, which is largely initially targeted towards red, red blood cells, consideration is that you should transfuse one red cell, then if the patient needs a second, you can order a second, but don't necessarily start with two red cell units. So in our EPIC order sets right now, 
you can see we have this transfuse the minimum amount of blood products necessary. And then if you click this link, you go to the AABB Choosing Wisely campaign. And the first campaign kind of slogan is don't transfuse more blood than absolutely necessary and refers to some of the liberal versus restrictive transfusion threshold studies. I think from an oncology perspective, although there are not many randomized trials at all in this regard, um, consideration for over transfusion could lead to transfusion related immunomodulation. There are some studies, particularly in animals, that potentially growth factors in blood can be associated with increased malignancy and metastasis, as well as infectious disease complications, not necessarily transmitted from the red cells themselves, but potentially the recipient's immune system is modulated such that bacteria or fungus that they have in circulation are then able to grow. So if you have a patient who's having kind of a suspected, quote, classic transfusion reaction, most important thing to do is to stop the transfusion. We can, in EPIC, order a transfusion reaction workup. And then, although I'll go through different transfusion reactions in a minute, I just wanted to briefly tell you what we do on the blood bank side of things once you send us a tube of blood. So the first and most important thing that we do is a clerical check to make sure the patient got the blood that they were supposed to get. So even in the best of institutions, Yale included, wrong blood is given to the wrong patients. This is often um, an error at the level of patient identification. So we have a number of kind of checks and balances to uh, most accurately identify the patients. However, this still happens every year at almost every hospital. So as part of this clerical check, we also repeat the patient's blood type, and we may repeat the blood type of the unit that they were transfused with. We spin their sample to see if there's any hemolysis after transfusion, and we compare that sample to their pre-transfusion cross-match sample. We may do a post-transfusion direct antiglobulin test to see if they have bound IgG to their red cells. And then depending on the reaction, we may gram stain and culture the unit if we suspect it to be contaminated with bacteria. And we may ask you for a urine sample for your patient if we suspect a hemolytic transfusion reaction. The reason that we have all of the strict rules in place for transfusion reactions at this and all institutions is because we worry about your patient having an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. This certainly can be deadly. This is often due to wrong blood being transfused to the wrong patient. And this is a slide I like because it really shows you many, many, many signs and symptoms. And any given patient on any given floor probably has some of these signs and symptoms at any time point. So this is a very conservative list. If your patient is receiving blood and they have these symptoms, you at least need to think in the back of your head, could they be having a hemolytic transfusion reaction? And you might notice that the symptom at the top of here is fever. So in addition to acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, which we can prevent by blood bank being extremely careful, by nurses and other um, phlebotomists collecting the blood being extremely careful, is to obtain an adequate transfusion history from the patient in order to prevent the risk of a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. So red cell alloantibodies, which is something I study in the lab and we're not going to discuss them in detail today, occur in about 5 to 10 percent of all transfused patients. Like any other antibody, these antibodies can become detected, say between 7 and 21 days after transfusion, depending on the antigen type, might take up to three months after transfusion. And then most of these antibodies, more than half of these antibodies evanesce or go below the level of detection. So say your patient was transfused at Bridgeport um, three months ago. They made a JK8 antibody. Now they come to Yale. You're seeing them in your clinic. You send us a sample. You don't tell us that they've previously been transfused. In the blood bank, we can't detect any antibodies. We then transfuse them with cross-match compatible JKA positive blood. And within three to seven days, they can be having a hemolytic transfusion reaction. So unless you tell us in EPIC that they've previously been transfused elsewhere, we will not know. I know this question is annoying to many clinicians, but it is really important, and this is why it's important. Um, soon, EPIC is going to obtain a functionality of branch questioning. So if you select yes, we're then going to ask you what hospital your patient was transfused at. And this is really important because there is no national red cell alluminization database in the United States. All right, so this is a slide taken from the FDA website of transfusion fatalities by year over the past five years in the United States. 
You can see that hemolytic transfusion reactions, whether they're acute or delayed, whether they're due to ABO incompatibility or non-ABO incompatibility, in combination make up the second leading cause of death of transfusion in the United States, with the first leading cause of death being attributed to trolley or transfusion-related acute lung injury. <coughs> So trolley typically happens in a patient with little underlying pulmonary problem who comes in to get a transfusion. The transfusion may be plasma, may be platelets, occasionally is red cells, but this is often a plasma-mediated process, so it's more likely in products that contain a large amount of plasma. The patient may have problems breathing, they may become hypotensive, they may become hypoxic, they may develop fever, and when you get a chest x-ray, as you see on the left-hand side here, they may have bilateral whited-out lung fields. So this is something that kills about 10% of patients, but many of these patients go to the ICU and within a couple of days, um, their chest x-ray returns to normal. This is most likely largely an HLA mediated process um, with women multiparous donors being most likely to have HLA antibodies. So at this institution, we only use male plasma and at many institutions around the country, to prevent trolley. However, not all trolley is HLA antibody mediated. There's probably a second hit involved. These patients have to be sick to begin with. Um, and there may also be lipids and other, um, I guess, compounds that can mediate trolley. All right, so you can also have respiratory problems from transfusion that are not trolley. So everything that is a lung injury associated with transfusion is not trolley. TACO is statistically much more likely. So TACO is just our acronym for Transfusion Associated Circulatory Overload, which is really just difficulty with your patient handling the large amount of fluid they got from a transfusion. So you might have a little 50 kilo 90 year old lady who received two red cell units, which is like 800 cc's over the course of four hours. She just can't handle that much volume. These patients usually get hypertensive. If you get a chest x-ray, they might also have bilateral fluffy infiltrates that looks like pulmonary edema. Um, they typically improve both from a respiratory um, perspective, oxygen um, perspective with diuretic therapy. And really in the future, probably the most important therapy for these patients would be to consider splitting units. So as you know, we have a rule in the blood bank that you have to transfuse blood products within four hours of leaving the blood bank. They have to be completely transfused by then. Um, that rule is because we don't want bacteria to grow in the red cells, for example, as they're sitting at room temperature. And in the blood bank, we keep them in the refrigerator. So you may have to call and ask us to split a unit so that your 50 kilo little old lady can receive half of a red cell unit over four hours. You can then give Lasix and she can receive the other half afterwards. So since I'm standing up here, I just want to take the opportunity to tell you about a study that we have ongoing at Yale, um, which is an NIH funded really multi, multi-million dollar, multi-institution study. And Ed Snyder sitting up here on the front row is the PI at Yale of this study. So it's a recipient epidemiology and donor evaluation study. It's again an NIH and HLBI funded study, really to look at transfusion complications. The study has many sub-studies, but two of these studies potentially impact your patient population, the oncology patient population. The first study is called STRIPE, which is severe transfusion reactions involving pulmonary edema. There are multiple sub-studies even with this, within this study, but this is largely a uh, retrospective, with parts of it being prospective, really case review study. So we're not going out to recruit your patients, but we're looking at their transfusion histories, their x-rays, their oxygenation status, to try to determine how often pulmonary reactions are actively reported versus actually occur when you go into the medical record in more depth. And then the second study, which Ed has recently started here, is called RETRO, which is red blood cell in the elderly transfusion outcomes. And for this study, um, some of your patients certainly be, will, will be recruited. It's really one of the first studies to look at functional status and quality of life in patients who are greater than 65 years of age after red cell transfusion. So we hypothesize these patients feel better when they come and get one or two units of red cells in your clinic, but do they really? So not only do they feel better, but what is this doing you know, to their underlying disease? All right, so I just want to go over a few of the other reactions, with febrile reactions being the most common thing that we see. 
Again, fever was number one at the top of the list of incompatible or ABO incompatible or hemolytic transfusion reaction, which is why we have these very conservative rules. But if your patient has a temperature into the febrile range, which is greater than one degree Celsius into the febrile range from their baseline, they could potentially be having a febrile transfusion reaction. Now, your particular patient population is immunocompromised and may not actually have a fever, so you also have to look for chills or for other signs that the patient's not doing well. Now, Ed has our entire red cell inventory here at Yale being pre-storage LUCA reduced, which is a significant safety measure in addition to decreasing the risk of transfusion transmitted infectious diseases that are transmitted in white cells. It also very significantly decreases the amount of febrile transfusion reactions that we see. I would say we see fewer than two of these a week here at this campus. Um, again, the reason that we ask you to stop the transfusion if your patient has a fever is we don't know for sure that your patient isn't getting the wrong blood or isn't having an ABO incompatible hemolytic transfusion reaction. All right, and then really second to febrile transfusion reactions, urticarial reactions are what we see reported um, second most often. So this is a hive only reaction. Um, that occurs, at least on paper, in up to 3% of transfusions. I think, honestly, most of these don't get reported to us. This patient might have just hives, minor hives, or itching. If they have anything beyond that, it's not considered an urticarial reaction. It would be considered an allergic reaction, and you could not restart the blood. If they just have hives, you can stop the transfusion, give them Benadryl, give them any other therapy you want, see if their hives go away. And if they do, you would have the option to restart the unit in that particular patient as long as the entire entire unit was infused within four hours of leaving the blood bank. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about uh, risk-benefit ratio of premedication, but there are no studies that show premedication with Benadryl decreases allergic transfusion reactions, particularly in patients who have never had these reactions before. All right, and then just one slide on septic transfusion reactions. So this would be bacteria in a transfused unit from the donor itself. These are more, off, more commonly seen with platelets than with red cells because platelets are stored at room temperature for five days and the bacteria can just grow during those, those five days. Um, at the Red Cross or at the donor collection centers, gram stain and culture of these units are done prior to release. So that decreases the number of contaminated units we get. That being said, we still continue to rock these platelets at room temperature for up to five days. And so sometimes bacteria can grow that wasn't detected at the donor center. Um, red cells can also be contaminated, although these organisms tend to be unusual because the red cells are again stored at four degrees, but Yersinia, Citrobacter, and other bacteria can grow in red cells. <coughs> All right, and then the, I have two slides or three slides on coagulation factors I just wanted to briefly mention. But for the past year, we've had in the blood bank case Centra, which is a four-factor PCC, or prothrombin complex concentrate. It was FDA approved about a year and a half ago. This has replaced Bebulin, which was a three-factor PCC that we previously had. This product has two FDA-approved indications. Number one, elevated INR due to warfarin in a patient with life-threatening bleeding. And number two, elevated INR due to warfarin in a patient in need of life-saving surgery. So this reverses specifically um, warfarin. It has factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. It is not prothrombotic to the same degree that Novo7 is. Um, it's not associated with the risk of arterial thrombosis that Novo7 is because the factor 7 in this product is not activated. So unlike plasma, fresh frozen plasma, which takes about 24 hours to correct an INR in a patient who's on warfarin, so this is plasma, your INR is corrected within 24 hours. K-Centra, or four-factor PCC, corrects most INRs to normal within 30 minutes of giving the dose. A number of studies are ongoing to determine whether this rapid correction in INR is associated with improved outcomes, particularly for head bleeds, but in theory, it would be. So we have some documents on the YNHH intranet site that Ed and I have created that show indications for K-Centra as well as dosing for K-Centra. And if you order this in Epic, there's also extra information on how to order this product. Um, if you wanted to use this for a patient who had a head bleed and was on a novel oral anticoagulant, I would suggest that you speak with our transfusion physician, and that number is also in Epic. 
sometimes there's potentially a reason to use this in a patient who had a rivaroxaban head bleed, dabigatran head bleed, um, although the evidence is somewhat limited, but there are very few other options. All right, and then the last two objectives are quicker. <laughs> so we're going to talk about which patient should receive irradiated products and how you order this in EPIC. There has been a little bit of confusion about this over the past six months. So why would we order irradiated products to begin with? It's because we want to prevent as much as we can all cases of transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. Unlike the bone marrow transplant GVHD that you probably see every day, transfusion-associated GVHD is almost 100% fatal. And the reason is because unlike your bone marrow GVHD, transfusion GVHD also affects the marrow. So it affects your skin, your liver, your gut, like the GVHD you're used to seeing, but it also affects your marrow. This can be almost entirely prevented by irradiating cellular blood products. Cellular blood products are red cells and platelets in particular, um, also granulocytes. So FFP and cryo are not considered cellular products and do not require irradiation. But the irradiation, which we do via a cesium irradiator, can also be done be via an X-ray irradiator, makes the donor CD8 T cells incapable of proliferating in the immunocompromised recipient. This is a table I like of indications for irradiated blood products. There's some debate over who really needs irradiated blood products, um, but nothing on this list is very much debated. So if you have Hodgkin's disease, you're probably at the highest risk of TAGVHD of any patient population. Patients being treated with fludarabine are also at risk. Um, congenital immunodeficiencies, particular C those that involve CD8 cells, um, stem cell transplant recipients, anybody receiving a directed donor product or an HLA matched platelet um, must have irradiated products. This is kind of the grayer category. What if you have a solid tumor, you're being treated with intensive chemotherapy? Here we tend to irradiate um, products for many of those patients. Really across the U.S. practice varies greatly depending on whether the institution has access to irradiated products. So here we do, we have a cesium irradiator up in our blood bank. Um, there are some downsides to irradiating. The biggest downside being it takes a little while, you have to have the machine, and you can also have some potassium leak from red cells over the lifespan of the red cells, but many of these units we irradiate right before they're transfused into the patient. And if you have question about who needs irradiated blood products, we also have a link to irradiation indications within our blood ordering in EPIC. And these are um, Yale irradiation indications, which are pretty similar to the indications I just showed you. So when you're going to order red cells in EPIC right now, question number five asks what product modification you would like. You click on this hourglass and it brings you to the screen below. If you have a BMT patient, you would order irradiated red cells. And then if you have a question, did your patient really need it, you can click on the link of the irradiation tab to get that list I showed you of our Yale indications. If you want no modifications, you would click no modifications, realizing again we have a 100% pre-storage LUCA reduced inventory, so those have already been modified to be LUCA reduced. All right, and then our entire platelet inventory here at Yale is irradiated. Here on the left side, we have apheresis platelets. Here on the right side, we have whole blood derived pooled platelets. Um, right now, we have a mixed inventory here with about two thirds of our inventory being from whole blood derived pooled platelets um, because these are really more common. Um, apheresis units require a dedicated donor and are in relatively short supply in Connecticut. I would just want to say there's no perfect platelet product and I would be glad to talk with anyone afterwards um, about this further. All right, and then our last objective is to briefly understand routine premedication prior to transfusion is not evidence-based. <clears throat> so there's a complete lack of evidence that routine premedication with Benadryl and Tylenol prevents any transfusion reaction, whether it's an urticarial reaction, an allergic reaction, or a febrile transfusion reaction. But these medications, as you can imagine, may have unintended adverse outcomes, particularly Benadryl in elderly individuals who are receiving outpatient transfusions. So in the transfusion literature, there's quite a bit um, about premedications not being necessary. There was a Cochrane review done about four years ago now with the conclusion that no study exists showing that medication prior to transfusion decreases the risk of transfusion reactions in patients who have not previously had reactions. A historic problem here at Yale, 
I think made worse with EPIC is that your YNH oncology red cell adult transfusion order set had a box up at the top, which if you click, clicks everything in that order set, including pre-medication with tyl Tylenol and Benadryl. So if an ordering provider did not want those medications, he or she would actively have to uncheck those boxes. So as a result, the vast majority of transfusions um, I think at Yale and at Smilo in particular have been premedicated over the past year. So you've probably seen this on the LCD projector if you work in the hospital, um, but approximately a week or two ago, we remo re removed the ability to order Benadryl and Tylenol as premedications from every blood order in Epic on this campus, at Bridgeport, and at Greenwich, because there's no, again, evidence that these medications prevent problems, and in fact, they do cause problems in some patients. So something that's important to know, especially in light of this change, is that if your patient has previously had a transfusion reaction, if you can put this in the problem list of EPIC, the problem list transcends and counters, so will always be there. And as you go to order blood on your patient, if you have any transfusion reaction listed in the problem list, you will get this BPA or best practice alert that pops up, reminding you that your patient has previously had a transfusion reaction. And then you can decide whether you want to pre-medicate your patient or not. There's lots of debate and I don't know the right answer, if you have a patient who's previously had multiple, say, febrile transfusion reactions, should you pre-med with Benadryl or with Tylenol? And if you've had a patient who's had multiple allergic transfusion reactions, should you pre-med with Benadryl? And um, I think the answer, answer to those questions is not entirely known. All right, so I hope in 25 minutes we've achieved our objectives. I'd be glad to take any questions.